and we live in. We just press a little button and you go global. You whisper words on the internet. <laughs> and Paul wrote from a prison cell with no guarantee that his words would float further than the cell itself. But a knowing, he says, when you read this in 2022, Ephesians 3, I think it was verse 4, he says, when you read this, whenever, <laughs> you will perceive my insight. Yes. As a young pastor, I read that and I started weeping. I say, oh my God. We're not dealing here with the Holy Book. You know, we grew up, read your Bible, pray every day. You know, and we've got to do it. You know, whether you feel like it or not, we, you might go to hell tonight if Jesus comes and suddenly you haven't read your Bible last night. Oh, my goodness, it all changed. And I fell in love with Lydia, you know, because I was living, working with Youth for Christ in the southwest N Namibia, you know, southwest Africa. And, and she was living on the other side. And, and our teams all got together even after so many months of outreach. And in, um, in August of 20, 1974, I met Lydia. She was 16. I was 19. And, and uh, suddenly distance no longer mattered, you know. And, and I went back to Wolfish Bay in Namibia and I started writing. I thought my teachers would be proud of me, you know, because I had to borrow some stuff that my brother would read. He was a reader and my cousin could do good in German. So I, I borrowed it. And suddenly, you know, I no longer need my cousin or my brother to inspire me. Because love began to find a voice. And it just <laughs> affected my heart. When it comes to opening the book of the Romans of the ages, celebrating a romance that began in God. We did not begin in our mother's womb. Isn't that amazing? Right. Hi, we honor our parents. Thank God. Here we are. We popped out and we're on planet Earth. And Jesus didn't arrive on this planet in a Superman suit, you know, just sneaking in, you know, just to come and, you know, just check things out, do a few tricks and politely apologize for a faulty design. But he came here on a mission. To exhibit the detail of the Father. So that when you see me, you've seen the Father. When you see your Father, you recognize the features of your own being on display. There was no other mission. A, 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 agape has no other agenda but to be agape. God's not trying to become love and more loving. <laughs> God is love. <laughs> so Jesus didn't arrive here some secret way. He came through the only passport that we get here, through a mother's womb, flesh of our flesh, the destiny of the word fulfilled in the incarnation. Our youngest son, we've just been with him on way en route to, to America, him and his wife. He's been living in Switzerland for 15 years. Both of them are pianists and they're in the classical music world and her parents too. And, and it's just, it was just amazing to just get to see them and our little two-year-old We'll celebrate her beautiful life. She was just her birthday also while we were there. And, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about music is I, I can't read music, but I remember we would have Stefan's um, classic, what, what do you call them, these big pianos, your know, grand piano, in my study. But it was none of us. Lady and I don't play piano, so we'd, we'd cover it with a blanket and we'd store stuff under it. You know, things kind of land up there. Because once a year, Stefan comes to visit, you know, from overseas. He's been there for 15 years. So when he comes, you know, we take the, the, the rug off. <laughs> and I'll sit there and translate you in the corner of my desk. But I couldn't keep my eyes off him. You know, you'd start with a new piece. And I wouldn't know whether the piece is upside down the score, you know. Or, but I look at his eyes and I see the moistness in his eyes. He hears the language. He hears the word that was captured and documented maybe 200 years or more back where a composer heard the music. And now it's translated in incarnation language when that piano begins to move with his fingers and his mind and his gift. And uh, it's so wonderful that we are not called to study an old book. You know, my brother, look at the size of it. Can I have one of those, please? <laughs> You know, I never could see it when it's printed because we like, not the size of it, because we, we see it on a screen. But I thank God that the destiny of the word was not a book. And this thing's growing, it's getting more pages. But every page spells one language. The incarnation. The incarnation. The word has no further destiny. The best translation is the incarnation. It's just God finding face in human life. And as Mother Teresa said, you know, he shows up. They show up in their most disturbing disguises. They ask, so what, what, what bothers you to, 
you know, why would you bother to go out on the streets of Calcutta at such odd hours of the night? She says, I go to minister to my Lord in his most disturbing disguises. Oh, when our eyes ignite with the love of God, and we can begin to see people the way he's always known them. Brother Edger, what a song. My heart was just trembling and seeing those words. And Daddy's song, that is. That's Daddy's song. And you know what? Daddy dances over you with joy. Amen. He's not sitting in some miserable old mood. You know, look where the world's going. He doesn't, he doesn't read newspapers. I remember waking up one night in the middle of the night. We've been preaching, I think, about eight, at least 12 hours a day in Budapest. So I get to sleep and I wake up with these words. In the middle of the night, there is nothing wrong with the human race. I said, well, only God can say things like that. He doesn't read newspapers. So I got up and I got my pen. I just wrote, nothing wrong with the human race. That's good news to begin with. And then it's followed with, because there's nothing wrong with the design or the redemption. Nothing wrong with your redemption. The same God you can trust with him. Tomorrow morning sunrise. You don't have to check on him and say, oh, God, we just want to get the media angels. Do you remember, tomorrow morning, the sun's going to rise that time. And it's not just, it's like geographic. It rises all the time, sets all the time, anywhere, some, somewhere on the world. But the engineer of the universe has it all wrapped up. And the salvation of the human race. What is salvation all about? Jesus came to do two things. What did he come to do? To reveal and to redeem. The image and the likeness of God, invisible Elohim. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And so God steps into human skin, held for centuries in the womb of the prophetic word. And the true light that enlightens, oh, only if you believe it, brother. The true light that enlightens everyone was about to dawn. When Peter writes, I, mean, I love it when the fisherman starts writing. I mean, they, they, they didn't go to school. They, they had business to do at night. So they sleep during the day when everybody else is studying. So um, Peter, James, and John. Peter starts writing. He says, um, Second Peter 1, he says, you will do well. He says first, he says, we did not, he's speaking about the encounter on the, on the mountain of transfiguration. He says, we, we, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. We, we, we're not trying to, you know, just put together a nice new doctrine that's neatly packaged, you know, so that it, it'll somehow appeal to people and people come in. We'll, be, we'll create a new language even. We'll just try and so decorate the language that, that at least, you know, um, we've got something new to bring to the table. Remember those guys at that... Um, in Antioch, when Paul visited Antioch and the, the, all the Greek um, philosophers were there for centuries, daily bringing something new to the table. Why daily? Because they exhausted yesterday's information. So they're adding all kinds of ideas and philosophical thought in a quest to discover the invisible gods. And just to play it safe... Because, I mean, they were, they were good at what they did. They've practiced for so many centuries. So they would carve images out of wood and stone and decorate it with gold. And they would, they would always, you know, with, within the shrine context, add the altar. I mean, you can't do church without an altar. There has to be an altar. I can, I, I can do that. And what's the altar all about? No, no, you've got to pay something. You've got to bring something. Because you've got some hassles and problems in your house. This is how much it's going to cost you. So, I mean, no witch doctor in South Africa or in Africa will make any money unless they can persuade their client that the reason you've got this trouble at home is because some deceased old granny or aunt of yours, some distant relative, is particularly in a bad mood at the moment. So the badder the mood, the more expensive the goat. So, I mean, we we're going to negotiate a deal with God, you know, maybe get discount because we really tried hard last week too. And so Paul comes and he just takes the shrug out, rug out from underneath him because while he walks around, he finds an altar yep. dedicated to who? The unknown God. Yep. He says, this is my gap. I, I've got my line. <laughs> and he starts and he's, he's such a good fisherman now. You know, he says, guys, I mean, you, you're so artistic. 
I, I commend you for, for just the expression. You guys are amazing the way you've put these things together. But the one uh, altar that I had discovered amongst all your handiwork is dedicated to an unknown God. Would you mind if I introduce him to you? They're all ears, you know, he's a stranger. I love what he says, you know, he says, the God of creation, the engineer of the universe, notice his opening statement, is not far from each one of us. Now that's shocking. When I read there's a young pastor, I said, no, no, Paul, no, no, did you get, did you, did you mean us or us, who, us, us charismatics, us Pentecostal, us word, word of faith, us Presbyterian, us Baptist, you know, where, come on, just locate us. You mean, you could, don't, don't include the Muslims here. I mean, oh, God. He's speaking to some pagan Greek philosophers. They've been worshiping all kinds of ideas and altars for generations. And he then comes and says, okay, now, guys, something to say. While every head's bowed, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you forward, and I'm, I'm going to want you to make a decision for Jesus. Come on, you know what he does? He quotes them, their own books. He says, your own poets wrote. And the first one who wrote, Epimenendes, 600 B.C., Oh, Paul read this stuff. He says, wasn't it? You? Listen, this is familiar language. You, your poets wrote something. In him, we live. Certain days of the week, especially. But when we move, oh, oh trouble. You, know, you can move out of the blessings of God. How can you move out of the blessings of God? Oh, I make my bed in Hades. God shows up. He says, I'm here. <laughs> oh, but he's the omnipresent. How omnipresent is your God in your theology? I mean, there's not a space in the universe that is not occupied with all that God is. Ha. The heavens cannot measure him or contain him. Colossians 2, 9 says the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Godhead, bodily tabernacles in you. It didn't come with an overnight bag. Toothbrush, clean anapins, you know, I'm just here for the weekend. No, he came to settle down. You're the address of God, the most favorite place of God in the universe. It's humanity yes. dwelling in flesh. It's not an undersized shoe that God, Jesus had to squeeze in you because he pulled the short straw. And the father, son, spirit is, okay, Jesus, bet you got to go. And he's just holding his breath, you know, just hanging in you for, for, for a season. He came to establish the tabernacle. Of God. Wishes they had the most amazing meal in some restaurant. My goodness. Wonderful salmon and shrimp. That I, ooh, man. I said, you know, I don't want to eat too much. I'm still a preach on. I, I couldn't I couldn't stop eating. It was just so nice. I broke up the piece, just had a little bit at a time. And we celebrated what we celebrate in every single meal. Jesus says, as often as you do this, do what? Eat and drink. Because every time we eat and drink, we remember him. What did he do? He broke the bread and he said, take you eat. And what happens when you eat? Digestion kicks in. You don't have to concentrate on biology of digestion. It's just, you know, you smell it. You smell the kitchen. You smell the coffee. And something starts happening in your mouth. The enzymes start, bring it in, lay it on, you know. And food becomes flesh. And suddenly the revelation of the incarnation hits home. He says, do this as often as you should do this. Remember me. Amen. Every single meal, eat and drink. Amen. Because the face bread in the temple, in the Hebrew, the bread of the presence, is actually called in, in Hebrew, the face-to-face -face bread. Yeah. So every time you face food, remind yourself, I'm feasting the incarnation. Amen. Words, Amen. thoughts, food become as flesh. And we start eating the bread, the only piece of furniture in the entire tabernacle was a table and there was a lampstand the moment you move into the skinned area out of the outer court into the inner court there's only one lamp and it's artistically carved almond blossoms golden almond blossoms what's the almond got to do with it ask Jeremiah in chapter 1 God shows him something. He says, Jeremiah, what do you see? Someone can get me some water, please. I'd appreciate it. Um, he says, what, what, what do you see? He says, I see budding almond blossoms. 
God says, you're right. Because I am watching. In the Afrikaans, it says it better. And in, in the better translation, I am awake over my word to perform it. Huh. You know why it's called the almond blossom? That's perfect, brother. If you can just untop one of them for me, that's wonderful. If anyone else is thirsty, we can send the <laughs> bottle around. And careful, your Jesus turns water into vino. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a budding almond branch. God says, mm, that's it. Because I am awake over my word yes. to perform it. And I remember years back I read this and I thought, awake? And in the footnote of the RSV translation at that time it says, the word, the word for an almond tree is the awake tree. Because in Israel it's the first tree that wakes up from its winter sleep. Right. And it's a season dawning. It's an impossible to reverse this. I'm awake over my word to perform it. So there in the skin tabernacle, you know that the word tabernacle in the Greek is the word skenos. Do you recognize the sound of it? Skin? Sounds like skin, doesn't it? So in the skin tabernacle, and God says, remember, I don't dwell in houses built by human hands. <laughs> Eat ye, this is my body. <laughs> so engage the body of Christ. And the word becomes flesh and finds face in you. Finds voice in you. Finds presence in you. In that day you will know that as I am in my Father, so you are in me. Yes. Jesus, what are you talking about? He says, no, you'll know. You see, our knowledge doesn't reposition Jesus from wherever Jesus is hiding and puts him in the Father. There's no separation. Father, Son, Spirit. He's I and the Father. We are one. Amen. Ask the Holy Spirit. We are one. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. It's inseparably oneness. And it's in that day you'll know where you fit into the picture. John 14, 20. In that day you will know that as I'm in my Father, so you are in me. As, meaning equal to. Equal to my in the fatherness is your in meanness. And then he comes, he puts the Holy Spirit in the middle of it all. He says, and I in you. Remember what he tells him, same John 14, he tells him, do not let your hearts be anxious. Because they, 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 their knees are knocking. They think, Jesus, no, you've spoiled us for three years. We're walking here, we, we've witnessed everything. We, we, you cannot look, talk about living. He says, I will not leave you like orphans. Isn't that amazing? Amen. We are not in some orphan age where we're waiting for Jesus' second coming on the horizon. Right. One of the most horrible mistakes we've made in our translations is, I think it's one thing, and it's two. Um, I mentioned it there, how, how you know, in, in, I think it's a 20, 22 or 26 translations, it could be one Thessalonians. Here we are. I might get to second Thessalonians too, but... Um, that wasn't Paul's epistle. The first book of the New Testament was the first, first book of Thessalonians. That was the first one written. So anyway, uh, I'm on my way here to 1 Thessalonians. I think. No, 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2. I like it to, to just get the Bible open because then it slows me down a bit. So I can get, get running away and I want you to hear this. Um, I really, I, I was so honored to, to celebrate a meal on our way here with, with precious, four precious families and represented in their precious, the mother and father of this, of this is, that is happening. Far beyond buildings, far beyond anything that you could imagine. We're standing here on, on the harvest field. And this is a dump area before, wasn't it just? I love the way dump areas are re redeemed. <laughs> oh, Jesus, you're so good at it. Okay, so if you look at verse 19, I'm just, I'm just going to the little commentary note where I wrote there the Greek word parousia. Listen to this. Occurs 24 times in the New Testament. And guess what? 22 out of the 24 times, it is translated with something that has to do with the second coming and the day of judgment. You can go to Strong's Concordance. I mean, Strong's Concordance would say, uh, da, 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 what does Strong say? Oh, yes. 
the, the G, uh, G, that's Greek, 3952, Parousia, from the present particle, 3918, Pariemi, Pariemi. The advent, often return specifically of, of Christ to punish Jerusalem, or finally the wicked. 22 out of 24 times. It's like a word that, oh, he's coming. You know the word to do, I, I love, that's what the mirror exists for, we just dig into the little components. Para, it's a preposition that speaks of the, the, the closest possible proximity. And Amy, are there any girls here with the name Amy? Next time you meet an Amy, tell them what Amy means. It means I am. In the closest possible proximity. Of my I amness. That, that hints to the incarnation, doesn't it? God cannot get any closer to the human race than what he did in the skin of the man, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ, clothed in skin, in human skin, born on this planet, not to give us a new calendar so that we could celebrate, or at least we've got something to kind of schedule our next week by. You know, we've got 22. 22 after Christ. No, no, no. We, we're talking about incarnation. The, the time that has fully come in him. He walks through the fields with his disciples in John chapter 4. He says, do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Right. Of course you're right. But I'll tell you, you're looking at the wrong harvest. Yeah. Right. Lift up your eyes. I want to show you something. I want to show you something that you will not see in your best toil, in your best efforts to bring something to the table. I want to show you a bread that you cannot labor for. It's a bread that will not leave you hungry. Amen. This stuff will leave you hungry. Amen. But there's another loaf of bread. Yes. And it's the word that incarnates in flesh. Yes. Lift up your eyes. I want to show you harvest. And you know what? It's already ripe. Yeah, right. It's already ripe. Cannot get any riper. You ask any farmer. So when, sir, when, when, when is the harvest actually ripe? And they'll answer. Once the seed in the ear matches the seed that was sown. They say ripeness. <laughs> we were born anew. When? When he was raised from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus celebrates the success of the cross. No further sacrifice will suffice. He brought an end to the system of sacrifice, scapegoat system of the world. Go and read 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, or 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19 in the Mirror Bible. Redeemed from, by the priceless blood of Christ. From what? The futile ways that we've inherited from our fathers. It took some redemption to get our minds sorted. Ha, what a redemption we're celebrating. A redemption bigger than the detours of human history. The history past, present, and future. Eclipsed by his story. A greater story cannot be told. The word stepped out of the invisible realm into flesh. Flesh called sonship. Hebrews chapter 1 one says in many and various ways, God spoke of all to our fathers through the prophets. In the mirror we translate it in many fragments and glimpses of thought. Through a prophetic mouth, God spoke. God's never silent. God has an audience in mind. He spoke to us. Spoke to our fathers. But look what he says next. In the eschatos. You don't study any eschatology that doesn't line up with Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses. You want to study eschatology, you will never understand the book of Revelation until you understand the book of Hebrews. Because it's right there. It's all done. Because the revelation is the revelation of the what? Of the Son. Of Jesus the Christ. Of the Lamb of God. Amen. Behold, his cousin said, Behold. The Lamb of God. Yeah. Who do, you know, we've just done our, I thought it was our last mirror safari. I don't think we did. We did first, first of all, we did after COVID. But anyway, we've just, just, just a short while back, not, not even two, maybe two, three, two and a half, three weeks ago, we were in, in the bush in South Africa with a, uh, a mirror safari. And we spoke to some of the, the, um, the staff, you know, in the camp where we were. And I said to them, you know, they had a brilliant guide. Well, in both camps, we had this, this brilliant guides. And, um, and, and we saw so much. You, know, you, you, you see things that you... That, that you think, oh, no, no, it's going to take a National Geographic photographer to possibly bring it. But they've got to spend about three years there to get this. But, but we, we, we were just entertained with amazing, amazing, most amazing sightings. 
And I said to him, you know, when the guide points in a direction, you can have the most expensive camera that you could buy, the most expensive binoculars, but if you're looking the wrong way, you're not going to see it. You've got to, you've got to look at what, what, what he's pointing to. I'm not gonna, I've got, ooh, beautiful trees, bird flying overhead. And, but there's a leopard lying right there, but I'm looking in the wrong direction. And you've paid all the money to come and us I'm a South African safari and you miss a lion. Oh, because I'm, oh, there's, there's a cute monkey in the tree there. Whoa, hopping up and down. And, and here we go. And, and we get back to the camp. And say, so what did you see? You saw what I saw. Because in the same vehicle, it's a good guide. The guy's whole entire, he wants to park the vehicle in such a way that everyone, he checks around. He's seen what's ever happening. He just wants to make sure. And sometimes, you know, you see just a little glimpse of a sighting. And you've got to just talk quietly and show in the rocks. And you talk. And you talk. And you look at all these people. I mean, they, they just want to be there. They want to see something. They've come to see it. And now they're looking around. And you know what? When someone sees it, you sit there and you just watch their faces. Because go. You know what the next thing is they do? Yeah. Yeah. It's not my little private leopard. I'm going to just, and at the camp, I'm going to boast. I'll just quickly sneak in the photograph. No, no, no. The entire idea is when you see something, you want to include someone else. You never, ever need to teach discipleship programs, evangelistic programs. Never. No, don't waste your time on that, brother. Don't waste money on stuff like that. It just points it in the right direction. Because behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. I mean, John is in tears. He says, oh, in, in Revelation chapter 5. And remember, he started off with hearing a voice behind him because it's already happened. It's past tense. It's, it's the prophetic word. It's the lamp that's shone and the, the bread has come. <laughs> so he's weeping. He says, who is worthy to break the seals of this book? Hallelujah. Honey, yes. The Lion of Judah, of course. Yes. Now, come on, if you, you're not so far and you're looking for a lion. And you see the little butchered lamb oh, standing. The slaughtered lamb of God is worthy to open the seals of the book. You cannot see the lion until you see the lamb. And there's wonderful things we could say about kingdom. You know, let's preach the kingdom, brother. But you see the lamb. In the same conversation in Hebrews chapter 1, he says he spoke in many and various patterns of thought. Glimpses of thought to our fathers through the prophets. But in the eschatos of God, the conclusion of God's conversation. <laughs> the conclusion of God's conversation. The bottom line, let the less die. He has spoken to us in a son. It doesn't say this son, he says son. Sonship. Having made, no, no, first of all, what does God say? He says he's the exhibit. He's God on display. He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, the Father judges no one. All judgment is given to the Son. And what does the Son do with all judgment? He cries out in John 12. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is what? Put on ice. Cast down. How is that going to happen, Jesus? He says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all. What's the subject of the sentence? All judgment. And to me, every idea of judgment you could possibly imagine, he's taken it. He says, listen, I'll be, uh, I'll be the, uh, I am the Lamb of God. It's not, it's, it completely disarms religion. Because every religion, you name what it is. You, you, it's all about, you know, something that I've got to bring to God to try and negotiate a deal with God. Because we're dealing with a moody monster, especially if we created him in our mind. This God can be, you don't want to get God come down here. And sort out our politics and our... No, no. We're not dealing with a God who's anything less than what Jesus is. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. He comes to introduce us to ourselves again. So that we may know even as we've always been known. He's the exhibit of the Father. The Afrikaans. Wie is Afrikaans? Is Rudy. He's the uitstraling van sy He's the beaming radiance of God. He displays the character, the character. Do you hear that word in the Greek character? The character of God. He, God never behaves out of character. He doesn't behave out of character. That's why Jesus' brother, remember none of his brothers believed in him. John 7 verse 5. None of his brothers believed in him. 
Until after the res- resurrection, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus also appeared to. He appeared to several individuals. To, well, at, at the time, there was more than 500 people. Paul, when he wrote it, he says, many of them are still alive. He also appeared as to one untimely born. Oh, yes, and to James, the Lord's brother. So James suddenly discovers his brother. And what does he hear? He says, he's the father of lights with whom there is no variableness. No shadow due to change. There's no hidden agenda here. He's a father of lights. Oh, my Lord. And he, Egeneto, he brought us forth. He gave birth to us through the word of truth. The truth about what? The truth about you. He says, whoever. Oh, yes. And then he, he concludes that verse. He says, having made purification for sins. He sat down. The entire economy of the throne room is the celebration of mankind's redeemed redemption. There's nothing less to the gospel. There's nothing less. There's nothing wrong with this world because there's nothing wrong with redemption. God succeeded to rebirth the human race in the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. We are the resurrection generation. Whether we like it, believe it or not, you are. And the greatest adventure in this life is discovery this side of your grave. Because we're the other side of his grave. So you might as well discover something that is absolutely true about us. It's true about us. It's, it's true about the most common person that we've called common. The most unclean is equally true. He shocked Simon. Remember Peter? Praying on the roof. That's where my name comes. Dutwa on the roof. I'm in the Bible. Dutwa. Don't try that unless your roof's flat. So he's praying on the roof and... And you know what gets him? Hunger pains. Does he pray? And he gets hungry. Isn't it amazing how God works within our natural situations? Your next meal is an unveiling and a celebration of the incarnation. But the menu might shock you. Oh, Peter's lucky he has his mother and his mother in law and his wife traveling with him. So you can imagine the man he's praying. And he's just, he's in, he's in Yaffa, Yopa. Yaffa means beautiful. He's just raised the gazelle from the dead, Dorcas. You can imagine, he's, he's on high, he's flying. This man's flying, he's soaring. Woo-hoo. He's just, he's seeing stuff. You know, he's just, and he's in prayer. He's not like in the, oh, I'm doing my daily prayer. No, karabo, shebarab, I'm praying. No, the man is like, woo, in ecstasy. And then, you know, hunger can sometimes interrupt your devotion. And you're going to sneak off to the refrigerator. And I'm sure he was leaning over, you know, and says, Mom, <laughs> You know that favor? Oh, yes, of course she knows this dish. And Luke writes there, while they were preparing his food, <laughs> he's not going to be disappointed. But he didn't expect this one. The man smelling the food, the enzymes are kicking in. He's rushing you through his prayer. He's thanking the Lord. I mean, he needs to say grace because mom's cooking. I mean, that's blessed. That's going to be a meal. Woo-ha! I can't wait. Mom, hurry up. Mom. And suddenly, he has an open vision. A clean, beautiful tablecloth. He sends. And to his horror, the media angel of the day must have made a mistake. I mean, it's full on the worst horror picture you can imagine for a Jewish palate. Very sensitive to kosher food, please. Every unclean animal, bird, a reptile. Now just for a moment, think back on some stuff that you've seen on National Geographic. I mean, we're constantly introduced to animals, reptiles, birds, insects that we've never even imagined existed on the same planet as us. We're not talking dinosaur here, we're talking stuff that's like alive, right, alive and well right now. I hope not too well, but they're there. <laughs> oh my goodness. And Peter doesn't say a thing, he just, the frown on his forehead just increases. <laughs> Mom, hurry up with that cooking down there. <laughs> so, graciously, the vision is removed. And Peter goes, wow, uh, that's great. I wonder who's, who's trying to say what? <laughs> What's God throwing meaning in all this? Whoop, again, same vision. Moves. <laughs> Three times. And in verse 28 of chapter 10, I'm busy translating Acts chapter 10 right now. Very significant for America. For the entire world. He says, God has shown me 
that I may no longer call anyone un common or unclean. Amen. Why? What's happened to everyone? Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah in disguise, has stepped into our earth suit, scapegoat language, as the Lamb of God, disarming every, every definition of sacrifice, bringing a full stop to the sacrificial system, canceling the altar. Behold, the Lamb of God. God has shown me. That I may no longer call anyone unclean or common. So what do I call them? Significant. Significantly clean. My next meal. My next meal. <laughs> Ask me for the nations. Amen. Oh God, but I'm just trusting you for this new car. You know, I really need this car. Or I need this. Or I need that. He says, it's only one prayer request. Ask me for the nations. Isn't that wonderful? The very verse that Paul quotes in Acts 13. In Psalm chapter 2. Ask me for the nations. And behold, I want you to see something. I have given you the ends of the earth as your inheritance. Oh. No wonder Hebrews chapter 6, 17 says that God speaks our language. He says he has no one greater to swear by. Why would we swear? Because we want to bring an end to all dispute. So we've got a great business idea. We, we get together, we find a good lawyer, and we th say, listen, lawyer, do you represent the United States of America, in whatever country you're operating under? You bring an official representative of the United States government to get some weight behind your excitement to do this business, and you've written out your entire business plan, and now you want to get a stamp, not just from, okay, well, do we agree? High five, let's go. And then sooner down the line, something changes. We want to bring a higher authority. We want to add weight. So God desires to show more convincingly. Isn't that beautiful? God desires, Hebrews 6 verse 17, God desires to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise. I mean, it's already a promise. And now God says, listen, I want to, I wanna, you're not quite persuaded yet, so I want to make it more persuasive. Why? Because I want to bring an end to all dispute. He says, when you sit down, you don't have to first check the chest, turn the chair up, and this is going to hold my weight. Yeah. You just kind of lean back. And he sat down in the throne of the authority of your redeemed innocence. It's not make-believe. There's the authority of God weighing down in the throne room of your redeemed innocence. <sighs> Having made purification for sins, he sat down. There's nothing more to the throne room except our absence, and we've not. He says, in that day you will know that as I am in my Father, so you are in me, and I am in you we're in this together forever whether you sign the dotted line believe it no, no you can be hostile or indifferent whatever you are whatever your mood is for right now this is the truth about you remember jesus says in john 10 john 8 he says uh, If you continue in my word, you will know the truth. What does that mean? A red letter edition Bible, let's read all the words of Jesus. No, no, no. His word begins in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the first word in the, in, in the, in the Bible is berosh, in the head. No, you did not begin in your mother's womb. I tell people in Otsuren, and I live in the Western Cape, South Africa. I tell them, you know, I bought, I bought this little device in, in Otsuren, but I did not congratulate the shopkeeper. Because I know enough that know that it didn't begin in Otsuren. It landed there. Neither did it begin in the factory in China where it was assembled. Where did it begin? Somewhere around Santa Cruz, I think. Or this specific device. But it, it began somewhere in someone's mind. Everything that we see created began somewhere. It's, it's some thought that, pooh! 
You, you think of something and blah, 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 then it happens. And you get it done. You began in the mind of God. You're the idea of God. Isn't that amazing? So he says in John 8, if you continue in my word, that means to discover that the entire book is about the word pregnant with sonship. What is sonship? It's image and likeness. It's a daddy's love song. We just held the first or a beautifully newly printed Bible in German, just the, some of the Pauline epistles. And it's just, it's just beautifully bound. And it's, the cover is just two hearts that merges in, in this love celebration, love letters from Papa, love letters from Papa. So here we are, we are in, engaged in this, in, this, in this place where we continue in the word. And what do we discover? Freedom. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And the Pharisees stand a little bit back. They said, but we were not slaves of anyone. You forgot Pharaoh, didn't you? <laughs> Just the picture of their slavery, the prophetic picture. Jesus says, Abraham saw my day. Yahweh hire. Yahweh sees. What did, you see, Abraham saw my day. So suddenly what God saw, Abraham's eyes were open to. Abraham saw, what, was, what did Abraham see? His son asked him, so father, where, where's the sacrifice? You've got the fire, you've got the wood, where's the sacrifice? And go and read carefully what Moses, because Jesus began to speak from Moses' words when he spoke to the two and they were two miles. Look, and Abraham saw, where? Behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Amen. Whose day did Abraham see? <laughs> he says, you continue my word, you will know the truth. You will know the truth that the Lamb of God has come to shock you out of your religion. To shock you out of my best sacrifice I could ever give. The most expensive sacrifice money could buy. I'm offering this to God. We've got need to do. I mean, they built most of the, 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 the I always almost call it tourist attractions in Europe. The, the big, wonderful, beautifully, magnificently built um, temples. And, and what do you call it? Uh, cathedrals. With gilt money. The very first printing press was made out of mirror metal. He was a mirror salesman. It was in the 1500s. And he, he, he carved the first letters out of the mirror metal. That would become the first printing press. And you know what they printed? Bibles. And the Afrikaans word is afkoop briewe. What's this called brief in English, brother? Um, what, what's... The, the, when you know the, 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 what you do to purchase to, to buy some time for some deceased relative out of purgatory indulgences there we go <laughs> isn't that an ex exciting word i mean they sell indulgences come and indulge yourself you know on your dead relative's behalf and come and finance our cathedral guilt money built the largest houses decorated most spectacularly with beautiful things Paul congratulates them. He says, I want to introduce you to the unknown God. We're back in Acts chapter 17. And he says, whom you worship, remember, he's not far from each one of us. God cannot get closer to the human race than what he did in the incarnation. When the word became flesh, that's as close as God can get. The eschatos, the completeness of every prophetic word, was carried in the womb of Mary. A little teenage Galilean girl. Held God in her womb. Let it be to me according to your word. Your word. That dates back to the seed of the woman. That will crush the serpent head. That will crush the head. This mindset that we've inherited. The futile ways that we've inherited from our fathers. Eating from the evil tree. The tree of the knowledge of good. And what evil? Poneros is the Greek word. Because it's the Bible in Jesus and Paul's day was the Greek Bible. So they, poneros, full of labors, annoyances, and hardships. I've redeemed you from that. To eat my flesh. Abraham saw my day. And before Abraham was, I am. 
That's the history in reverse. The one that John heard of word, word in the Revelation chapter one behind him. Oh, I was preaching in Kenya once to a group of pastors for a week, and, and we were going to get through uh, Hebrews 13, verse 8, I think it was, you know. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. Guess what? We didn't, didn't get past. In that time, we couldn't get past yesterday. Huh. I remember 2010, I know the World Cup's happening right now, and I just heard that Argentina beat uh, Croatia. I'm sorry if you Croatia. Cause I, I don't follow the, the, the soccer or anything. We just didn't get time to. But we did watch you in South Africa. We hosted to 2010. 2010 FIFA, we hosted it in South Africa. <coughs> Maybe tomorrow I get a chance to tell you something. Remind me if we don't get. Let me stop you, my brother. 30 minutes sharp. Okay. I won't, I won't keep you long. It's just so, oh Lord. Miss Lydia now. She reminds me more. Thank you, Lord. Baba said, Nobody. Yeah, yeah, FIFA World Cup 2010. Thank you, Rudio, brother. May I go to. So wonderful to see. Rudy was part of our team in the 80s, our acts team. And he kind of hit the shores of the United States. And, and here we get to meet one another after so many years. You know, it was a few years back in South Carolina. The roar of the lion, remember? So here we're hosting 2010. And I remember in, as Africans, you know, we kind of held on to when we were all out of it, you know, Bafana, Bafana didn't do it. And so eventually we, we, we've got Ghana, still, at least they're still in Africa, which kind of Ghana's holding it for us. And, but just, just I'm going to be distracted again, so remind me where I've just been. I remember one day we were, we were preaching in a very remote camp in the Kruger National Park. I knew the guy was in charge of all the Christian activity in the Kruger National Park in there. They've got large camps, you know, towns for, for, their, for their staff. So I went into one of these very remote staff villages. In fact, it only held about 10 or 12 people in a remote area. And today's one of the um, uh, rhino, anti-rhino poaching units. But back in the day, then I get to go and visit the, the, the um, rangers in that, in that camp. And as they arrived, I noticed that the one guy, there are only a handful of them, the one guy has a pirate's shirt. Now, pirates is one of our big, big names in, in South African football. And then the other guy had a Chiefs. So you've got Orlando Pirates, and then you've got Chiefs. And I, I, I laughed. I said, you know, as humans, we, look at this. I mean, we're the smallest group. We, 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 we just made six, seven, eight guys, and here we are. We're together. And, and, and even in the smallest group, if we talk soccer football tonight, I mean, we're going to be enemies because we're going to have your camps here. You've already got it on. You've got the T-shirt. I'm, I'm, I'm a pirate supporter. And I'm a chief supporter. And it's, it, it spells trouble, you know. You don't. Yeah. So I said, to, I said, you know, guys, for tonight, just for tonight, our national team's Bafana Bafana. Can we just all put, all of us just put on a Bafana Bafana shirt, at least, you know, just so that we can put our differences aside. And just, we just, I said, that's where the gospel is. Yes. Because God is clothed in our skin. Yes fully represented we are yes. there's not a way that we can unrepresent ourselves you're already in before you thought you were out he found us before we were lost <laughs> jesus is not some new name on the program and god's gonna say okay we've run out of all these other religions let's try jesus he did not come to planet earth to start the christian religion by no means he stepped into an earth suit You cannot be more represented in the throne room than you are in the one who sits down on the throne. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I left all the beginning and the end. The conclusion of the entire world in me is the fullness of time. Oh, but we're waiting for another day. Lift up your eyes. I want to show you something you don't need to wait for because it's already ripe. Oh. Distance? No. Delay? No. Lift up your eyes. I sure hope it's already right. Dispute? No. No wonder God could whisper in my ear that night in Budapest. There's nothing wrong with this world. What's wrong then? 
we're seeing wrong. Blindfold mode is what the word Hades means. Hades, two components, ha, negative, edo, to see, not to see. And something like scales were ripped off Saul's eyes in his dramatic encounter on, the road, on, on his way to go and murder more Christians. He lifted up his eyes and saw, blind to for three days to his own, he says, we no longer know him according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, he says, from now on, therefore. That was his metanoia moment. Metanoia translates, unfortunately, in a word that doesn't exist in the New Testament. Repentance. No, 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 that's Latin for penance. You've got to pay again and again. It's like one of these, we in South Africa, you buy, you buy a phone, you've got to buy it on contract. You pay again and again and again and again. And there you go, and you just pay again and again. And that's how, you, you know, religion needs paying and returning customers. So you go, you go, pay, 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 pay. No, suddenly, uh, we, 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 there's a new economy that speaks. It's the economy of contentment. It's the con economy of, <laughs> it's more than enough. I woke up with this old song I haven't sung for many years. Just the other morning, I wake up and said, hey, remember that old song? He is more than enough. He is more than enough. He is El Shaddai. That's the many-breasted God. The God of plenty. The all-sufficient one. God Almighty, Yahweh Elion. Jesus is more than enough. Didn't he step down to meet man halfway? He said, I've done my part now. You do your part. Paul, Paul brings it to a conclusion in, Reve in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 27. He says, what becomes of our boasting? Oh, having just said what he did. He says, what becomes of our boasting? Now, that's, that's uncomfortable if your entire religion is built on performance. If your entire relationship, whatever it is, if something in your life is only built on performance, and we live in a performance culture. If America, America's coming, they've, they've got it right to the top. I remember when I fell in love with Lydia, and I remind me of I'm going to be a <laughs> So when I fell in love with Lydia, her cousin, Rainy Shiel, we were present in Stellenbosch, where he broke the high jump record for Africa. The highest any, Afri every, any African athlete has ever jumped. My wife's cousin, Rainy Shiel, guess how long he held the title? For 21 years. That doesn't mean that a few years later, like 10 or 20 years, he could still jump that eye, but at least he had it in his pocket. I mean, that was his gold medal. <laughs> and the fact that I was married to his cousin did not improve my ability to jump higher. So we, 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 we've got, in our doctrines, we've got the idea, okay, now Jesus did it. Oh, he did it all. Yes, of course, Jesus, our hero. It's wonderful. But he didn't, he didn't say, okay, guys, what I do, I mean, the 10, 10 commands, that, 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 that was his eye shot. You know, sorry, guys, what are we going to do from now on? We're just going to lower the standard. You know, you just bring the, the, what do you call the pole? We just bring it right down so that even the fat guys, we can just hop over and, and share in the same thing. You see, we underestimate the incarnation. The word was made flesh. Not so that we can be conveniently attached to what they call grace now. So that at least you've got a, a license. We don't need a license to sin. No, no. Oh, oh, people, oh, well, you've got, I mean, they said that to Paul. Unless you preach a gospel that makes people say that, then you're not preaching the gospel. I mean, Paul said, what, are you, but some, some say, as some say, you know, they just preach a license to sin. In Romans 6, just after he said in Romans 5 that God was in, he says, much more than Adam's transgression, out of all proportion to Adam's transgression, was the act of righteousness in Christ. And it's all included in the same story. I thank you, Jesus. Father, I was like Rudy. Hey? I said, I'm going to <laughs> okay, I'll go back. Woo, Lord, thank you. We'll end this now. Thank you, Lord. I mean, my book to mark. <laughs> so, Lydia and I, we're there in, in Dar es Salaam. And we're sitting on the roof of a little hotelish set up there where we, where we stay. And uh, we meet this bishop because uh, we, we're going to preach in one, not one of his church, one other church the next day. So, he came to meet us through some Facebook friends that introduced us. And so we're there in Dar es Salaam, our first visit there. And um, while we're talking, it's nice and cool on the roof, you know, and suddenly there's an eruption. Now, you need to know this. Uh, Dar es Salaam is a big city. And right around this little hotel is just people. And, 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 and uh, 
little, little houses and shacks and homes, and there's just multitudes of people living there. And all of a sudden, a very, very loud sound erupted around us, right around us. And after we looked startled, you know, and, and we saw the smile in the bishop's face, and we knew, okay, there's nothing to worry about. So he explained to us, he says, right now, Tanzania is playing New Zealand, one of the playoff rounds towards the FIFA 2010 World Cup. So um, we immediately understood. I mean, by the noise, you don't have to ask questions. That was a goal in Tanzania's favor. Uh, have you heard the, you know, the difference in sound? I mean, if, oh, they're going out, oh, they're going totally ballistics. We were in 1978, we were in Argentina when they won the World Cup. That's what I thought. Okay, well, because we, anyway, let's just go to Argentina now. Let's just stay right here in Africa in Dar es Salaam. <laughs> so let's come back with me to, to Africa. We're right here. So the bishop explains to us that, that, you know, that's what's happening. So the next Sunday, and that was the final score. And it was interesting about a score. Once it's official, it's official. That piece where I was going to go just now, because we still had Ghana, 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 Ghana. We still had Ghana representing Africa. And you know what happened? The, I don't even know who they played against, but there was a clear handball. But in those, they didn't have a replay. So, I mean, imagine winning the World Cup, and there was a clear handball back in the day. There was East King. You celebrate your victory, but it's half-hearted. Because you go and look, you see, it wasn't efficient. It wasn't, it wasn't actually. And that's why I say when Jesus, when you go back into Jesus, the same yesterday. You can slow motion yesterday. Every step of the way. There's not anywhere. There's not very right in the prophetic word where you can flaw the prophetic utterance of the Lamb of God. So, ah, the throne room behind you. So back to Dar es Salaam. Preaching the next, the next evening in a church in Dar es Salaam. And I congratulate them, obviously, on their victory. Over New Zealand. It was, it was happy times. For, for, and I said to them, okay, let's just go through it again. Remember there was a time when it was 0-0. Zero, zero, Tanzania 0, New Zealand 0. But then, oh yes, I asked the bishop, can we give me a few names of, of your players? And, and the one I, I wrote down and remembered was Thomas Maurice. So I thought, okay, Thomas Maurice. Now, I don't know whether he scored the goal, but I was, I was just uh, acting it out the next day. I said, listen now. And so, so the next day, you know, the, the, whoever the guy was, say Thomas Maurice, he sneaked through and he did his magic. And he scored the goal for Arjun. And the guys are going back into cheering mode because, I mean, I said, what happened to the scoreboard? Did it they still say zero New Zealand, zero Tanzania, but at least Thomas Maurice, he can get one. They said, you don't understand the game. Thomas Maurice's goal belongs to the team. The team's victory belongs to the nation, whether you're a soccer enthusiast or not. If you're Tanzanian, you're included. You missed it. You were in the bush for two weeks or three weeks or a month, and you heard the news afterwards. You weren't even near the stadium, near the radio, near television, and you hear, our team won. I mean, the joy hits you in the face because you represent it. You may be into ping pong or something else, but, but you're equally representing what happened there. And you know, that's the gospel. It cannot be anything less than that. Because if it's not that, it's not the gospel. If you're not included to begin with, wh what are you trying to do? Get in there. You're already in. Because in that day, you will what? You'll know that there's something in my Father. What does our knowledge do? Does that our, our knowledge position Jesus into the Father? No, we know that He is in the Father. And what else do we know? That we are in Him. And He is in us. That's the good news. I mean, it's good because it's good. Can't get any better. And it's news because it already happened. We're not going with good predictions. Okay, I've heard this rumor. John Rice says, what we've heard is rumors. Now, I saw 1 John 4. I mean, this man's 90 years old before he starts writing. This is 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. This is what we've heard rumors of. Our eyes have seen. And you know what the next thing is? You know, you go into these shops with all these fancy things. In the old days, I remember, especially as children, these, are these labels. It's such a disappointment. Do not touch. Why? Because it's natural. When you see something beautiful, you just want to touch. You want to feel... Can I own this? Your hands have touched it. Yes. Concerning the word of life. And the life was made manifest. Yes. Ah. Oh, Jesus, it's so beautiful. I don't know whether I've corrected in, the, in this translation, but the other day I just, now I'm closing with this. Uh, am I? Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One John. One John. This guy, I think the battery is going to... Yeah, here we go. You've got a little... When you, when you have the app, if you, 
if, if you haven't got the app and you cannot afford one, then please contact us. We can give free apps to the, uh, unfortunately not the, the um, I've Apple wouldn't do it, it allow us to, but any Samsung or, or um, Android, Android based, we, could, we can send you the app for free. But then there's a little search, a little, um, what do you call it, the magnifying glass. And you hit the little magnifying glass and you just either choose the book you want to read from or a word that you want to look up. And go and look it up. It's all it's like a little commentary access. So here we are, one John. One John one. I discovered something the other day. And then off I do that because I cross reference while we're doing a new book. And then I cross reference, you jump into something, that's why I constantly just add a few things app. And so the app's nice, it gets uploaded at, 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 at unfortunately at the moment only about once a year. And um, David Blake's working on it right now. And um <coughs> yeah. Okay, so we've got it here in verse four. I just read verse four. This is now after John said, let me just read you, it's so beautiful. The Logos is the source, verse 1. Everything commences in him. The initial reports concerning him that have reached our ears and which we indeed bore witness to with our own eyes to the point that we become irresistibly attracted now captivates our gaze. In him we witness the tangible, eb, tangible life in its most articulate form. What we have heard, what we have seen, what our eyes have gazed upon. Gazed upon. It's, it's not just, okay, well, just, you know, we've got millions of, of sermons to work through, and we've got this entire school to do. So we just, we just, just no, no. He catches your eye. He says, I want you to gaze. And what do you find in the gaze? The reflection of you. It's right there. It cannot get more intimate, cannot get more personal. It's right there in your face. It's the mirror. It's not a display window of. Something new that's added to the list of stuff that you've got to do. It's the mirror. It says, with unveiled faces, we're beholding the what? The glory. Whose glory? The glory of the Lord. At this time, I see in a mirror. God's glory is nowhere else to be found. Nowhere else. God's glory doesn't have any further face or definition than what he has in you. You remember Isaiah 40, every high place, da, 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 da. And the glory of the Lord, verse 5, the glory of the Lord in the wilderness, a highway. Every high place, every low place, every crooked place, all the question marks, exclamation marks. And what, what's, what's the conclusion? And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. With unveiled faces. With unveiled faces. We're not looking at some mystery, the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations now revealed. You see the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. And metam metameros happens. Metamorphe happens. Metamorphe is not something I get a certificate at the end of a course. Ah, it's an awakening. It's the opposite of the word translated sin. Ha, martia, is ha, without meros, without form. Metameros, with form. As easy as that. Where does metamorphe, mor where does metameros happen? Gazing in the mirror with unveiled faces. All right, so reading all this just to get to verse 4. I uh, started preaching it. I'm just reading verse 4. My heart is bursting with joy. I did this just m a few months ago. And so it's not in your Bible. You can, you can contact us. I'll send it to you, but it will be in the, in the app. My heart is bursting with joy as I write this epistle. The thought of you reading these words completes my delight. Now, I used to translate it, and most translations say, um, I'm writing this so that your joy may be full. But the your and the our is very similar. It sounds the same in Greek, but it's a different little letter. So, um, Bruce Metzger, the New Testament textual commentary, one of the best um, commentators and um, New Testament people. I mean, Bruce Metzger is renowned amongst all scholars, you know, everywhere. So, anyway, yeah, this is way back. Anyway, so I'm just re reading this to you. Uh, in my commentary note, I said, reading Hemuan, our joy, is preferred over Hemuan, your joy. Since John's own joy would be incomplete unless his readers shared it. Whereas copyists, because we're only sitting with copies of copies of copies of copyists. There's no original text. So the copyists, and, and thank God for what we've got in the Bible. I don't knock the book. I mean, I'm just saying thank God that it survived so many generations and so many translations and so many interpretations, you know, because the copyists would do what I do. They would write their commentary, but there's no brackets and italics. 
So it becomes text. Notice what Bruce Metzger says about it. His readers share John's own joy would only be would be incomplete unless his readers shared it. Whereas copyists, insensitive to such a nuance, would have been likely to alter it. This is Bruce Metzger writing it there. Can I read it to you again? My heart is bursting with joy. Can you hear Paul writing from the prison cell? Hey? When you read this, you will perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. My heart is bursting with joy. Like when we met you guys, AJ, really, and to be here in this moment. My heart's bursting with joy. I'm not trying to sell the mirror Bible, come on. Oh. The best translation is the incarnation. But you're going to get a better clue in this one than any of the others, I promise you that. Teenagers write to me, they say, you know, Uncle, we're not afraid to turn the Bible, the book, a page in the book anymore. But then Lydia would get these thick letters from me, you know, way back. We were dating across Africa, you know, whoo, and, and I couldn't wait for hers. And, and, and I would smell it and, 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 and I would page through it with no, no hint of an idea that there might be a little fine print clause that, you know, that's performance related. Love carries its own language. And love can be trusted. You know how faith works? Faith worketh by love. There's a bit of King James for you. Faith worketh by love. Faith worketh no other way. Faith cannot work any other way. Faith is ignited by the agape of God. Oh my goodness. You know, God's love is in a happy mood that you find God in one day when you're in prayer meeting and finally you break through into gosh, horrible sin. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, do you feel the goosebumps, brother? I love happy times. I really do. I mean, uh, but faith happens. Faith is not something you do. Faith happens when you un understand and realize what he has done. And why did he do it? Why would you bother Jesus? Because he knows you. He loves you. Yes. <laughs> He's known you from the beginning. And he's only loved you. There is no other agenda in God. But to ruthlessly love you. Oh, happy day. My heart is bursting with joy as I write this epistle. The thought of you reading these words completes my delight. I thank you, Father, that we are your joy. Thank you, precious Father. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing that we can just ask? with open face and see the glory where it's been all along we've wasted so much time trying to get there when there is who we are to begin with go seat go seat go in throne the safest place you can be and if we out acknowledge I mean I'm talking to Ellen and Leanna Platt's home yesterday so okay says to me I'm sending you the Wi-Fi password and suddenly <laughs> it hits on my phone accept and you know what he says done complete I says it's dangerous to say done and complete in some circles because it's a done deal if our technology can be trusted to the extent that you're in the proximity it jumps right there and right there no distance. It's a done deal. Thank you, Father. Thank you, my brother. That's it. You see you guys in the morning sometime. <laughs> oh my God. Good. Good. Oh my Lord. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Oh my God. <clears throat> I can't help but so when usually when we end our services we've been ending them by saying first John four nineteen, which says I love him because he first loved me. How can I know? My God. He knew me. He knew me. And he loved me first. 
He loved me first. That's what he's telling us tonight. This is the message that travels around the world, and this is the hope of the nations. Christ in you is the hope of glory. My God. So please, we'd ask if we have a couple elders that can come and take plates. We'd like for you to bring an offering if you can and give him something. We are going to give him an honorarium because we believe in the message. We believe in what he is saying. We believe in what he's preaching. But if you could, please give to this ministry and give to them, to he and Lydia. And I'll tell this story while you're getting ready.